Welcome everyone and welcome to Hospital at Home for Cancer Care, a webinar sponsored by the Hospital at Home Users Group presented in partnership with the Academy, American Academy of Home Care Medicine, the American Hospital Association, and the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. We'd also like to recognize the generous support of the John A. Hartford Foundation for the Users Group and this webinar series. I'd also like to say a, a few words about the Hospital at Home Users Group, which you are already likely familiar with and which is hosting this webinar. Led by Drs. Bruce Leff, Linda DeCherry, David Levine, and Al Sue, the Users Group is a dynamic collaborative of people and programs dedicated to implementing hospital at home programs and expanding its footprint in the US and Canada. The group shares resources and best practices, works together to expand the quality uh, and reach of our programs and is developing the program and policy standards to inform regulatory and reimbursement policies necessary to spread this hopeful model broadly. You can find more information on our website at HAH usersgroup.org, where you can also visit our technical assist, assistance center, excuse me, a library of resources that we've created and made available on all things hospital at home. We also have a webinar series, including the ones listed here from last year, uh, both the slides and the recordings from all those webinars. Uh, more information will, will be released about our 2022 lineup of webinar topics, so please stay tuned. It's now my pleasure to introduce Susan Denser, the, the moderator for today's webinar. Ms. Denser is a senior policy fellow at the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy, the Washington DC based arm of Duke University that focuses on health trans system transformation, biopharmaceutical policy and other key health policy issues. Susan is a health, uh, highly respected thought leader, frequent speaker and commentator on television and radio and an author of commentaries in Modern Healthcare and the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. She's the editor and lead author of the book, Healthcare Without Walls, a roadmap for reinventing US healthcare. She previously served as chief executive officer of the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation, has been senior policy advisor to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, editor in chief of the journal Health Affairs and on-air health correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Please take it away, Susan. Thank you so much, John, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm pleased to be moderating this very important session. In this webinar, you're going to hear from five groups of five different organizations that have adopted hospital at home approaches to caring for cancer patients. We can summarize the basics of what you're going to hear today in about four main points. First, as you will hear, the cancer hospital at home concept has arrived and it's here to stay. And in fact, uh, having been a pioneered, of course, years ago by Bruce Leff and his colleagues uh, in the non-cancer arena, it has now moved firmly into the cancer arena. And so for any doubters who may have thought that cancer is way too severe a condition to allow for a hospital at home, today's presenters are going to prove them wrong. Second main takeaway is that just as cancer is many diseases and multifaceted diseases at that, so too is cancer hospital at home. Each of these programs is different. Some focus on different aspects of cancer care from home-based infusions and other administration of cancer drugs. Uh, some are focused more on in-home treatment of, of symptom exacerbation. Some are focused also on palliative care and much more. They're organized and staffed differently, and they're financed differently. They're also at different stages of implementation or duration, as you'll hear. Third take-home point is, despite all these differences, these organizations have faced some common challenges in getting their programs up and running and in maintaining them as we will hear. Uh, in fact, uh, in some instances, you'll hear some of the themes that you've heard in other hospital at home user group webinars, uh, support, uh, obtaining support from clinical leadership, obtaining support from institutional leadership, again, common themes. And the fourth takeaway is that despite these challenges, the passionate leaders you will hear from are committed to these programs because they know that being at home is far and away the best option for many cancer patients. You're going to hear that message loud and clear as we proceed. 
I want to say that we are also compiling a comparison grid that captures some of these commonalities and differences. That's going to be posted on the Hospital Home Users Group events section site shortly. And let me introduce the first of our five uh, presentations now. This one from Huntsman at Home, the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'll introduce our main presenter, first of all, Kathy Mooney, whom, as you see here, is Director of Research and Evaluation at Huntsman at Home, as well as her other credentials. And she'll be joined in the Q&A session in a moment with Karen, uh, when we complete all the other presentations, I should say, by Karen Titchener, as you see, Director of Strategic Development at Huntsman at Home. So, Kathy, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. We will try to give you a, a, a running overview of our program. And we have a couple of publications so that you'll be able to go back and look at those as well. Our uh, program began in 2018 in a 25 mile radius of the Huntsman Cancer Institute that is within the Salt Lake metropolitan area. So we were pre-pandemic in trying to pioneer uh, cancer care in a hospital at home um, model. It, our program is exclusively for cancer patients. It began in the cancer center and continues there. We have received referrals in the Salt Lake program from inpatient settings, clinics, and self-referral after they already had a Huntsman at Home stay. We to date have not taken directly from the emergency department. Just recently in July, we have ex extended Huntsman at Home to three remote rural counties in southeastern Utah that are a two to five hour drive from the Huntsman Cancer Institute. If any of you have come to our Red Rock Country and Moab, that is the general area where our rural outreach is. And so we're trying to develop a model there that would have hospital at home supports to people not living near a cancer center. So we have in our program both home-based acute episode care and subacute care that may go on for a period of 30 days but we have not given chemotherapy in the home to date, although we see how important it is uh, for our rural area. Our model is led by nurse practitioners in partnership with a local not-for-profit home health agency for the registered nurse visits, PT, OT, social work as needed. We do have an oncology and palliative care Huntsman at Home Medical Director who supports the nurse practitioners and also the nurse practitioners work very closely with the patient's oncologist and oncology team. Um, the home health agency bills for their visits and Huntsman at Home NPs bill for their visits. Unfortunately, an acute care model of care does not uh, reimburse traditional home health visits sufficiently for the number and um, also the level of services provided. And so to do our program, we have um, interacted in it as a demonstration project that had generous supporting from philanthropy, the Huntsman family um, philanthropy, and also the Cancer Center clinical funds. And we've also had research funding from Cambia Health Foundation and the Rita and Alex Hillman Foundation. Some of our stats to date, we have taken care of since 2018, approximately 950 acute and subacute patients. We're currently collecting patient and caregiver outcomes and satisfaction. And we hope to have that analysis completed this spring and will be forthcoming. We do have a program description of Huntsman at Home that was recently published this fall in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. And we would direct you to that to have sort of a detail of how we operationalize the program. Just of interest are what are the kinds of acute episode care we do. As you can see, there are often multiple reasons. So they come with joint diagnoses, but the common ones we've seen is pain, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, adult failure to thrive, neutropenic fever or infection, acute hypoxia, and non-surgical bowel obstruction. 
we have done an, an analysis um, of the healthcare utilization in a comparison to a uh, comparison group. The way that we drew the comparison group was to look at patients who would be eligible for a Huntsman at Home admission, but lived outside our service delivery for Huntsman at Home. And we prospectively selected uh, patients that were in the acute program uh, and who would have been in the acute program, except that they were not qualified within the zip codes we served. So we had a 367 patients altogether that we did the comparison, 169 were Huntsman at Home patients. And we found that in the 30 days after they were admitted to Huntsman at Home after an unplanned hospitalization, that we had 55% less unplanned hospitalizations in the 30 days after. They had, um, they, if they, if in the host, those who were hospitalized, they had a shorter length of stay by 1.13 days. There was no difference in ICU stays as we expected because we're not in providing intensive care at home. And uh, emergency department visits were reduced by 45%. In line with that, re there was a 47% uh, percent reduction in charges. Key lessons we've learned is to really go at it as you set up a program that is brand new as a learning health community so that you are flexible and you carefully look at your data and make changes along the way. So you have to adapt to the context. And one of the things between how we do Huntsman at Home in the urban setting near the cancer center and how we do it in the rural different uh, area is different. The other thing is usually you start a hospital at home program with the idea of treating ill patients, but eventually you also start to think, how can we reduce illness from it becoming an acute episode? And so that's some of the continuing monitoring in the home. And uh, one of the things that is very clear is that we need new payment models that in Utah, there is still a highly fee-for-service and traditional home health reimbursement, and those models are not sustainable for a hospital at home program. Just a comment before we end on our rural program, because that's sort of our new baby that we've been working with since July. And these, um, the circle area with the two arrows, the lower arrow is Moab, Utah, if you've been there, and the upper area is Price, Utah, which is our other area. And there are no oncologists in this three county area. There are two hospitals, one in Price with 27 beds, and the one in Moab, so think about this next time you're hiking there, is only 17 beds. We have about 250 HCI patients who are actively uh, getting therapy and treatment. And our rural model is a little different in that we take it as a population-based model uh, rather than a referral. And we have added both paramedics and a nurse care manager in order to um, meet some of the social determinants of health that we find in other challenges for rural patients seeking cancer care. The main one being tra transportation. Uh, we have tried to work with the balance of in-person and telehealth. There is a high degree of financial toxicity. Just imagine what the gas prices were this summer to drive up to uh, Huntsman at Home for Care. And there is a fierce self-reliance and independence and uh, issues in terms of health literacy that we find a challenge there. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. And thanks for the uh, very vivid description of why this type of program could be of such great value to patients in rural areas as you've just described. We're gonna to move to our next presentation now, as you see here, supportive oncology care at home by the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And to go to the next slide, our featured speaker for this portion is Ryan Nipp, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And you see his other credentials there. Ryan, your turn, over to you, please. Thanks so much. And thanks for the opportunity to present today. 
I'm going to talk briefly about our program, which we call Supportive Oncology Care at Home, which actually uh, Dr. Mooney brought up with this idea of preventative care. So how can we be providing longitudinal care to patients to try to prevent that acute care episode? So I'll just kind of walk through this briefly, and this explains a very, you know, large overview of what we're doing with multiple different programs that we're testing. And today I'm going to talk about our pilot program that we previously completed. So we received funding from Stand Up to Cancer to conduct a study that was a part of a parent trial of neoadjuvant fulfirinox for patients with pancreatic cancer. And for that study, this is essentially how patients uh, were cared for. So a patient with pancreatic cancer who was on this parent trial, who was it within 50 miles of Mass General was able to enroll in this sub-study, which involved Medically Home, which is a hospital at home program in Boston. We had patients reporting their patient reported symptoms each day throughout their entire time receiving the neoadjuvant fulfirinox, which is about four months. They were also doing daily vital, vital signs, which includes blood pressure, heart rate, temperature. And we asked them to do weekly body weight. And this was all provided by the Medically Home group. That information was monitored daily by Medically Home, and we had developed very detailed algorithms for when to call the patient and when to visit the patient at their home to evaluate and help manage some of these issues that may arise. And the other components of that program actually that I should mention is that we also scheduled patients to have IV fluids at home on day three, day five, and an optional day seven of their chemotherapy cycles, which were 14 days in length. And we also had daily phone calls and daily communication between me, a GI oncologist, and the medically home group in order to make sure that any sort of questions or oncology questions that came up throughout that day were addressed in a timely fashion. So with this pilot study that we conducted from January 2019 to September 2020, we enrolled 21 patients and we had a patient that actually moved out of our radius and moved out of state. So we had 20 participants in this study. With this first study, we just hope to address feasibility. Would, would patients actually enroll in this type of study and would they actually complete those daily assessments? And so what we found with this study was that over 80% of patients who we asked to enroll in the study participated in the study. And then we also asked about patients, um, how often did they complete their daily symptoms, vital signs, and their weekly body weights. And so what we wanted to show is that patients were willing to enroll. So over 80% of patients enrolled in the study. And then you can see here on the right underneath intervention completion that the vast majority of patients completed the daily symptoms, daily vital signs, and weekly body weight. Overall, 13 out of 20 patients completed every single day and every single body weight within the first two weeks, which is our primary aim of that study, which again was over 60% of patients completing every single daily symptom, vital sign, and body weight. So we met those feasibility criteria, which is fantastic. We also asked patients, caregivers, and clinicians about acceptability with this model of care. We asked them if it was helpful to have their symptoms monitored, their vital signs monitored, body weight monitored, how convenient was it to have all of these things done, and what was, how was the timing? And, and so that's what this shows here on the bottom right for intervention acceptability. The vast majority of patients reported that this was helpful, convenient, and the timing was just right. And so we also wanted to explore some basic outcomes with this model. And as I mentioned, this was a, a, a made up for a nice natural experiment where we had patients who were on a parent study of neoadjuvant fulfirinox who were enrolled in our study with Medically Home, which is MH here on this slide. And what that helped us do is had a natural comparison group, which was the patients who, for whatever reason, did not enroll into the Medically Home program, whether or not that it was the parent study had opened before we had opened our sub-study, or for whatever reason, they had said no to the sub-study. But we tried to get a population that looked like the patients who enrolled on Medically Home, kind of, kind of like Dr. Mooney did with their study as well. These patients were actually all within the 50-mile radius for that non-Medically Home participant group here of 24 patients. And we wanted to compare some basic outcomes. So for example, treatment delays, urgent clinic visits, uh, ED visits or hospitalization, and the mean proportion of days spent in the urgent clinic ED or hospitalized. And what this shows here basically is that the patients who had medically home, which is on the left, the 20 patients in our pilot, a lower proportion of those patients had treatment delays, a lower proportion of them had urgent clinic visits, and a lower proportion of them required ED visits and hospitalizations. We weren't powered to look at statistical significance, that's why we don't provide p-values here, but these are quite compelling results. So in summary, we successfully completed this pilot study that has showed the feasibility of the supportive oncology care uh, at home model. We enrolled over 60% of patients and over 60% completed their daily assessments within the first two weeks of enrollment, which was our primary outcome. Uh, so what we, we hoped to find, which was demonstrating feasibility and acceptability, we were able to find with this study 
And as I mentioned, we couldn't evaluate efficacy in this pilot study, and we're currently focusing on future work, which entails a larger randomized controlled trial with adequate power to actually look at the efficacy of this model for decreasing healthcare use and imp improving clinical outcomes for patients and their loved ones. So we were asked to talk a little bit about a representative patient story, and we have a lot of patient stories. I can tell you I, I've done a lot of supportive care work, and this by far has been the study that patients have raved about, have loved more than any study that I've ever conducted. We've had you know, interviews on our local news station we, we can talk about, but what I think is interesting from what I've seen in this study is the other side of the coin, which is the clinicians and the caregivers and how much they have loved the supportive oncology care at home model as well. It, one of the other interesting pieces of this is, is how my colleagues, the clinicians, the oncologists, the nurse practitioners in our group in the clinic, when we first introduced this idea, it was a little bit of a, a paradigm shift. You know, it's, it's shocking when you hear that we're going to do this at home. And then within months of starting this program, you can see everyone's mind shift and people just rave about this program. How can we get more of our patients on this program and just have fallen in love with having this supportive care at home, which largely speaks to how well the patients are being cared for at home, but also how helpful it is to the clinicians. So I thought that was something important to, to talk about with, with this model. And with that, I'll wrap up my section. Thanks again for the time. Great, thank you, Ryan. Could you just quickly say a word about why the clinicians found it so helpful to them? Yeah, so a lot of what we're doing at, at Mass General, at least, and, I, and probably at other places, is that throughout the day, we receive, you know, emails or phone calls that a patient's having symptom urgency or a crisis at home and needs help. And we're in the middle of a busy clinic and our schedules are already jam packed full and it's hard to kind of fill in these slots with people who aren't feeling well and getting them admitted to the hospital in the middle of a busy clinic day. So if medically home, number one, it's a lot easier for patients to reach out to medically home and be able to get in touch with somebody immediately and have this physical person on the phone talk you through how, how you're feeling. And then two, they can actually go to the patient's home. The patient's not feeling good. Their loved one is going to have to lug them into the car, get them to Mass General and fight traffic. And then whether or not they're going to get admitted or not is a whole nother hassle. And so taking all of that off of the patient's hands, off the loved one's hands, and then off of the clinicians and the clinic staff is just a game changer. It's been so helpful to have. Great, great. Thank you for making those uh, very important points. And we're going to hear now from our next program to present, which is the Penn Center for Cancer Care Medicine at, of course, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And if we go to the next slide, I'll be happy to introduce the person who will present for that, who is Lindsay Zink, as you see here, Associate Chief Administrative Officer at the in the Cancer Service Line at Penn Medicine. So Lindsay, over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Susan, and thanks for having me today. So I'm uh, presenting some work on cancer care at home that uh, came out of our Penn Center for Cancer Care Innovation, which is led by uh, Dr. Justin Beckelman and Callie Scott here at Penn that is uh, founded by the Abramson Cancer Center. And um, as Susan mentioned, I'm the Associate Chief Administrative Officer for the Cancer Service Line here. And so I oversee our cancer center clinics as well as our infusion suites. And I was part of the project team for uh, this initiative. So we've really launched the uh, Cancer Care at Home program in November of 2019, so pre-COVID. And what sort of led us to that work is that we really just knew we could be doing better. Um, we aim to really demonstrate that home cancer treatment really could for you know, the right drugs and the appropriate patient populations take the place of either inpatient administration or outpatient administration. There was four things that we were really optimizing to. Uh, we knew we could improve the patient experience by providing a really new patient-centric model of care while trying to maintain quality and safety. Uh, we also sought to improve the clinician experience by trying to ease some of our infusion log jam and reduce some of the friction associated with offering this new patient-centric model to patients. Uh, we also were looking to improve our capacity at Penn Medicine and our margin by trying to move some of the delivery of low margin drugs to the home. And then we were also looking to create an opportunity for uh, clinical and financial alignment with payers to help Penn sort of get ahead of some of the new site of care policies that have emerged and are continuing to emerge. 
Uh, so our cancer care at home coordinating team in collaboration with sort of multiple stakeholders, uh, stakeholders across our uh, Penn Medicine Enterprise and our different departments, including our uh, Penn Home Infusion Therapy, which is our uh, home infusion entity that is um, operated by Penn. Um, we were really charged with testing how cancer treatments typically administered in either inpatient settings or outpatient settings at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, how those treatments could theoretically be moved uh, to home. And so our team together evaluated a list of cancer drugs that could uh, technically be administered in the home. And then we evaluated each drug based on Number one, was the drug uh, stable enough and safe enough to deliver in the home setting? Um, number two, was the target patient population a population that would be safe to receive care in the home? Uh, we also looked at insurance coverage restrictions and would there be additional costs to patients to be able to receive a drug in the home versus in the inpatient or outpatient setting? And then lastly, we looked at whether or not it would be economically sustainable for Penn to administer the drug at home versus in the inpatient or outpatient setting. Uh, and you can see our results here. So it, it really worked uh, quite well. We launched the Cancer Care at Home program in February of 2020, so really immediately pre uh, the onset of COVID. And during the first six weeks of implementation from mid-February to mid-March, um, the program grew by 700%. Uh, so we had providers um, re refer uh, many patients to receive at that time seven different cancer agents uh, for administration in the home. And so that included things like uh, Lupron as well as Zoledronic acid, uh, acid or uh, denosumab um, and a few uh, additional agents. And then from March of 2020 through July, we continued to see the program really, uh, really increase. And at that time, our census went from 40 patients to about 450 patients. Um, so we continued to see like more than a tenfold increase in the number of patients participating in the program. Uh, and during that time, we also upped our number of drugs in the program from about uh, seven different agents to, to 13. Um, I think what we saw was with the rise of COVID-19 cases in our region, there was really increased clinician demand for uh, drugs, chemo care delivery at home, in particular for uh, drugs like Lupron, uh, as well as EPOC. And so that demand really, um, really skyrocketed. Um, we also had, you know, during that time, our executive sponsors across the health system were able to provide us sort of incremental support to get this effort going. And so we leveraged roles like a Penn Home Infusion Therapy Liaison to really provide concierge communication services for patients and providers. We also leveraged uh, triage nurses, uh, particularly for breast and prostate cancer and lymphoma patients that were receiving either Lupron or EPOC to try and streamline the referral process for home treatment. Um, and then the really neat thing was we were able to redeploy existing infusion nurses uh, from our uh, ambulatory infusion suites and actually send those nurses into the home uh, to deliver these treatments at home, which was a, a huge win for us in terms of making sure um, the care was safe as we, as we piloted this and also making sure the continuity was there um, because it was the same nurses that treated these patients in the infusion suites now going into the home to deliver the treatment at home. Uh, luckily, some of the dip in uh, ambulatory treatment volume during that time period because of COVID allowed us um, the opportunity to do that. So um, that's the story. We've uh, continued to try different agents for home administration. So we looked at um, about 13 uh, different agents and you could see uh, their names there in the smaller font. Uh, we, we experimented also with uh, like 17 additional agents that are given in the home um, now on top of those. But we really focused primarily for this work on uh, Lupron, which is you know a, a drug that's given for breast and prostate cancer, as well as EPOC, which is a multi-agent regimen that's typically given in the hospital setting. Um, today, we uh, have uh, 3,000 patients with cancer that are cared for by Penn Home Infusion Therapy in the home uh, annually.
So people often ask us, how, how did we do this? How did we uh, pull this off? And I think our answer has been that you really have to have the right patients um, and the right drugs. This will not work for every patient or for every drug. And so the things we had to think about there were, you know, could the targeted patient population safely receive this drug at home with a huge emphasis on, on the safety piece, um, especially with these drugs being administered by oncology certified nurses in the home certified through the Oncology Nursing Society. Um, we also looked at the right drugs. So we looked at drug stability, we looked at drug safety, and that helped us ensure that we were only doing this for drugs where it was safe to, to deliver them at home. Uh, from a Penn Medicine perspective, you also really have to consider financial sustainability uh, as well as, you know, reimbursement and benefits. And so we looked at things like, are there insurance coverage restrictions or additional costs for patients to receive the drug at home uh, versus the inpatient or the outpatient setting? Uh, we also looked like whether or not it would be sustainable to administer the drug uh, at home versus in the inpatient or outpatient setting. So I think those were really our uh, keys to success. So in terms of the patient feedback we've received, uh, patients love it. We surveyed patients about their experience with cancer care at home, and that feedback was largely very positive. Uh, we use something called the Net Promoter Score to assess patients' overall satisfaction with cancer care at home. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar, that Net Promoter Score is an index that ranges from negative 100 to 100, and it measures the willingness of customers to recommend your product to others. So it's really used as a proxy to gauge uh, the customer's overall satisfaction with a product. So um, a net promoter score of uh, greater than 30 is thought to be high. Um, the average net promoter score in healthcare is uh, 27, just for a frame of reference. And so our Cancer Care at Home program had a net promoter score of 83. Um, just for a little context of, you know, why the patients love this so much, we have, you know, our patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that were getting EPOC, they were able to receive five of their six total EPOC treatment cycles at home. That meant they were spending 25 fewer days in the hospital um, over, uh, over a given year, which is just huge. Um, patients with breast cancer or prostate cancer that are getting Lupron at home, they have an average of four fewer outpatient visits through this treatment modality, um, about nine fewer visits a year to the treatment center for breast cancer and three, visit, three fewer visits for prostate cancer. So I think that just underscores why patients love it so much. Um, for clinicians, they loved it too. We surveyed them about their experience with cancer care at home. Uh, our clinician feedback was largely very positive. We again used the net promoter score to assess clinicians overall satisfaction with the program. Uh, clinician satisfaction uh, had a net promoter score of 64. Um, and again, just, in, you know, a general score for net promoter, anything uh, greater than 30 is considered to be high for healthcare, the average is 27. And so uh, a score of 64 for our clinician feedback is really um, quite high. And so I'll close uh, with a patient story. This is a story about a 71-year-old patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he was able to receive four of his six total cycles of EPOC at home instead of as an inpatient at our hospital, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And so that really means that he spent 20 fewer days less in the hospital than he would have before we started this Cancer Care at Hope program program. Um, that gave him valuable time at home with his wife um, and his dog that you can see there next to him, which was super important to him. And it also freed up inpatient capacity for other patients during a time, you know, and the peak of COVID where we were really pressed for inpatient capacity. Um, he said, you know, I'm just so much more comfortable at home. I sleep so much better because the machines aren't constantly beeping. Uh, I'm living my regular life. I'm able to walk my dog a, a mile a day. Um, it, for those of you that weren't able to, to notice that that backpack that the patient is wearing um, is actually filled with chemo. And so you can see um, the, the tubing there that's, that's connecting to the hymn. So that's pretty neat. And uh, his wife actually gave this quote. Um, she said the best way to sum up the difference between undergoing EPOC chemo in the hospital or at home is that it really transformed uh, my husband from being a patient back into being a person. Uh, and so that is our story. And uh, thank you for your time. And I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And again, what, a, what an inspiring story and quotation to really drive home how important these programs are to patients.
I'll introduce our next presenter and uh, presentation group. That's, of course, the Mount Sinai Health System and its version of Hospital at Home for Cancer Care. We were to have been joined by the person uh, in charge of the program, Cardi Smith. You can see pictured here. Cardi, unfortunately, has had a family emergency. So standing in for her is Al Sue, who, of course, many of you are uh, familiar with the users group will know well. So, Al, I'm going to turn things over to you now to present about this program. Thank you, Susan. And I'm pinch hitting. Uh, I was asked to pinch hit for Cardi about 30 minutes ago. Uh, I, uh, Cardi is our, is our oncologist champion uh, in our program. Uh, I am not an oncologist. Uh, I am an internist geriatrician and incidentally uh, someone who was treated for lymphoma almost four decades ago, all in the brick and mortars hospital. Um, so uh, by way of overview, you know, our Cancer Care at Home program is embedded within a larger Mount Sinai Health System hospitalization at home program that delivers, you know, uh, the essential elements of hospital at home care at home uh, in the four boroughs and four boroughs of New York City, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And for those who live outside of the catchment area, our oncology program actually has an apartment available for use by the patient and caregiver. Uh, there are two pathways to get in to our program for oncology patients. There's the traditional hospital at home, uh, traditional pathway, which we have operated now since 2014, taking patients directly from the emergency department. And we also have, since the pandemic, a completing hospitalization at home pathway, which we call CIHA for short, which admits patients from the inpatient unit to complete the remainder of their acute care at home, assuming they have additional acute care needs at home. Uh, MS, the Mount Sinai Health System Oncology has had the most success with the CIHA pathway, which has included, you know, CIHA admissions for patients with solid tumors, for multiple myeloma uh, patients uh, between BCEP uh, chemotherapy episodes, and for lymphoma patients between EPOC chemotherapy episodes. So this has been our experience to date. Uh, the oncology program has had a later start than the rest of our uh, program. And to date, we've had 25 admissions, including three repeat patients. They've been with us an average of about five and a half days or a little longer than our typical hospital at home patients. And the median number of days that they've been admitted has been four. Uh, it's been primarily solid tumor, but as I mentioned, we've had some experience with multiple myeloma as well as lymphoma. Uh, our number of patients escalated back to the MSH, or hospital, uh, has been two of the 25, or approximately the same percentage as we see in the rest of our hospital at home program. And the number of Mount Sinai hospital days that have been saved by, this pro by these 25 patients amounts to about 114. So these are some uh, 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 details on the payment models that we've used for our two pathways. For our hospitalization at home pathway, they're basically, you know, uh, the payment model is a 30-day bundle with eligible payer contracts that we use for the oncology patients as well as for other patients. Patients must be covered by one of the following national providers or regional providers with whom we have contracts for either commercial, Medicare Advantage, or Medicaid Managed Care. We also have a pathway since uh, uh, in the last year for the CMS waiver, which includes uh, CMS, uh, which includes Medicare, traditional Medicare patients. With the completing hospitalization at home pathway, the payment model is a little different. There, you know, Mount Sinai Hospital builds the payer their normal BRG and pays the hospital at home program a daily rate that has been worked out. Currently, during the pandemic, all payers are covered except for liability insurance. The majority of the oncology patients have been admitted through the CIHA pathway. The CMS waiver impact has enabled fee-for-service traditional Medicare patients uh, to have, uh, to have uh, admission directly from the ED. 
So uh, here are some lessons learned. Physician buy-in from oncologists has been a challenge. You know, uh, once we've once they've experienced, you know, our hospitalization at home program, uh, some, however, some of them become converts in the process. The challenge, you know, to us has been a having a consistent patient referral and identification screen, as well as, you know, what we call, you know, uh, a lot of excessive communication and back and forth during the handoff process. Uh, and as with uh, uh, the rest of our program, we've had some restrictions, you know, with prescribed opioids that has been a challenge for these patients. Some of the lessons that we've learned has been to start with less complex cases as proof of concept, safety, and benefit, uh, to standardize the patient identification process, as well to streamline communication, you know, in terms of uh, uh, via ethics to reduce the back and forth communications between our oncologist, the oncology team, and our hospital at home team. Our plans for future expansion include, you know, not only expansion within our currently designated areas of solid tumors, multiple myeloma, uh, uh, as well as uh, EPOC, uh, but uh, autologous uh, stem cell transplantations uh, that we plan on taking in the future. Great. Um, before before breaking off, you know, during the Q and A, I can I will also be joined by my colleague Linda Desherry. Great. Thank you so much, Al, and thanks again for pinch hitting for Cardi. We'll go to our final presentation now uh, about Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center's plans for a cancer hospital at home program. I'm very delighted to introduce the presenter for that, Karen Adelson. Chief Quality Officer, as you see there for Smilo Cancer Hospital. So Karen, over to you. Thank you. So um, I really wanna thank all the trailblazers who presented before me and whose programs have really inspired us to move forward at Yale with this program. And I also wanna thank our host, Susan Denser, with whom I'm privileged to be in a master's program and who approached me about um, starting a cancer hospital at home program with really excellent timing because our health system was moving forward with a cancer hospital at home pilot um, at, during that time period. So our hospital at home program is gonna focus on cancer patients who meet criteria for hospital admission. So these are primarily patients who have acute symptom exacerbations, non-critical infections and treatment related side effects. And as we were putting this program together, Al Su, who just presented was generous enough to talk and really gave us some amazing advice to really not think about cancer type, but to think about the constellations of symptoms and the types of presentations that lead to hospitalization among cancer patients. And what we found when we did that is there really is a lot of close overlap with general medicine admissions, which would really allow our program to build on um, the general um, medical admission hospital at home program that Yale was working on. We are not a home chemotherapy program. And I just wanna say we are not enhanced home care. This is a substitution for acute care hospitalization. And again, um, building on the greater health system efforts in our hospital at home program. Um, we are currently still in the planning stages though very far along while Yale New Haven um, finalizes a contract with our care delivery partner, Medically Home, who you've already heard about through Mass General. So it's not finalized yet, but um, the work is underway. So the key features of our program, um, twice daily nursing visits, um, and our Smilo leadership team felt very strongly that these nursing visits needed to be provided by nurses with training in acute inpatient care. So not by home care nurses. So we would take our established experienced oncology nurses and give them the training uh, related to sort of the different conditions of working in patients' homes, but they would have that ability to recognize um, patients who were clinically unstable. Um, 
we realized very early on that we did need a clinical partner. We went through a, a sort of elaborate um, program evaluation, looking at different potential partners. And at this point are moving forward with contracting with Medically Home, who will provide us with resources that, and infrastructure that we have not currently developed, but will over time. And I think that that is the nice thing about this relationship. So uh, there needs to be a 24 seven command center, IT infrastructure that integrates with our Epic Medical Record, but allows documentation in the home and tracking of delivery of um, DME and other things into the home, um, potential paramedic support. Um, and the goal is that um, we will build some of this infrastructure so that our program becomes more autonomous over time, though we'll always have a continued relationship with a clinical partner who has um, demonstrated expertise in this space. Um, currently, the scope of the model is limited by the CMS waiver. So unfortunately, that means that patients either have to hit the ED or have been admitted to the hospital because those are the conditions of the waiver. We are hoping that over time, um, we will be able able to establish commercial contracts for direct admission to hospital at home and for um, hospital substitution with patients who go to our um, cancer specific urgent care center. Um, and we have currently have are developing a um, hospitalist oncologist co-management program for our inpatient care. And it is very likely that in the future, that program will be integrated with our hospital at home program. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about challenges. And I think it's appropriate that I do this because um, our program has been slow to launch. And there's a lot of reasons for that, that anyone who's considering launching a hospital at home program for cancer patients should think about. So luckily we had intense support from clinical leaders across the health system. We have some urgency, our inpatient beds are at 100 capacity percent capacity at all time. And our emergency department has um, stretch, you know, three stretchers deep and up to three day long waits. Um, so there's really clinical urgency for us to develop that program. However, in the wake of COVID, our revenue was significantly down uh, from what it was previously. And there was concern that even with the ability to bill through the CMS waiver, all patients who hit the ED would eventually make it through and allow the health system to be a uh, to bill a DRG. And so that while this program had clinical urgency, financially it was not adding incremental volume. Um, and without incremental volume in this post-COVID really tough budget climate, it was going to be hard to come up with the upfront investment which um, was needed to partner with uh, Medically Home or any clinical partner. The return on investment from that relationship would come eventually, but it wasn't gonna come immediately. And again, we were in a really restrictive budgetary climate. So we are working that through, um, and I am very optimistic that the program will launch this year, but it, you know, it has um, you know, required a lot of in-depth modeling on our finance side. Um, in addition, there were initial some regulatory concerns that by using the CMS waiver, we would have to provide an identical model for inpatients in the home that we do for um, inpatients in the hospital. And I think we have worked through that and figured out ways to meet all of those regulatory requirements. In addition, Connecticut had no pre precedent for ever doing this before. There was no existing policy for hospital at home. And the person who actually was uh, supposed to be in the, the seat that would uh, work on that regulatory process was a, there was a vacancy. So, you know, lots of challenges to work through, um, but, but all of which I think we're making exciting progress. So when we first were developing this program, we went to our patient and family advisory council and sort of proposed the model to them. One of the most interesting comments that came from patients is not actually on the slide, but one patient thought that they would enroll in this program and stay in the program for the rest of their life 
thus never, never having to come back to the hospital. And I think that while that um, concept is quite ambitious, it actually does get at the need that patients are desperate for the autonomy to stay in their homes and, the, and be in control of their own life. And we know that the hospital is not the place for that. One patient said, you know, I had to be in the hospital for 72 hours for antibiotics. I wasn't that sick and it seemed like a waste to have to stay at the hospital. Another patient talked about how hard it was um, being in the, uh, having her husband hospitalized so many times where she actually was able to stay overnight with him in the hospital, but how uprooting it was and how really hard it was, especially as he was facing the end of life when he really wanted to be home. And then um, another patient just said, this would have been a lifeline for me um, and actually asked, you know, most of these programs require that patients have a caregiver in the home. And uh, she really said to us, you know, don't leave out single people. You know, we don't want to be in the hospital either. So I think that that is something that I've really taken to heart. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. Well, thank you so much, Karen. And uh, it's very exciting to see that this program is likely to launch next year. And kudos to you and all your colleagues who will carry it forward. I want to thank all of our presenters. We had about 35 questions come in, and we've only got about five minutes. So I'm going to summarize a couple of them into buckets. Let me suggest that one of you uh, take each question. Uh, I think we'll be able to get through a couple anyway, and then we'll try to get some answers out to uh, others of you. Uh, perhaps we can put all of that together in a document that we can put on the website here. Uh, so one of the question, sets of questions pertain a lot to the care provided, uh, how IV controlled substances and blood products are provided to patients who need it? What about acute pain management and not particularly uncontrolled pain management? Uh, Kathy Mooney, could you just say a quick word about how you handle those issues at Huntsman? And then if anybody else is doing something radically different, you can pipe in as well. But Kathy? Let me throw that to Karen because Karen is the one who has been at the bedside from the beginning, the home side. Great. Karen? Karen? Yeah. Hi. I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to say that actually um, we very rarely have to do um, um, acute uh, narcotics. We do have a lot of uh, pain crises, but actually we manage that well with um, IV Toradol. Uh, what what our, our nurse practitioners do is they carry a first dose kit and uh, with them. And that has in order to, that we can be uh, proactive in our intervention. So we very qu quickly, you know, will give them that. And then if they need um, um, other IVs after that, then at least we've, we've calmed the situation for now. And then that gives us time to get um, any, uh, any titration of medication or narcotics from the, uh, from the pharmacy after that. We have had a couple of situations where we have actually um, managed to get, uh, you know, a subcutaneous uh, pump out there with narcotics in it for patients, but that's us working very closely with the pharmacy. And again, we would have still have given them the stat dose of the Toradol to try and do that. At the minute, we are not doing any blood products. Okay, great. Um, and again, Karen, a question for you. And if anybody else uh, is involved in CAR T cell therapy administration, you can answer this as well. But question came up about whether a uh, hospital at home is provided to CAR T cell uh, pac uh, patients receiving patients receiving CAR T cell therapy. Karen, uh, we haven't been doing that yet, but it is definitely on the horizon. Okay. Anybody else doing it now? Okay, let's move to, there were lots and lots of questions about finances and a lot of them, Lindsay aimed at you and coverage for uh, the medications in particular. Uh, I don't know if you've been able to follow the Q&A thread, but there were quite a number of them. Can you say a word about how the, that medication piece has been covered, if, if, assuming it has been covered by insurance? Um, no, I wasn't able to follow that thread in the chat, but I can I can talk a little bit about that without maybe seeing the question. So 
Um, from an insurance perspective, most of our patients getting uh, EPOC at home, uh, we didn't run into coverage issues there. Uh, our patients getting Lupron for breast cancer at home, we didn't run into any insurance coverage issues there uh, for the most part. Where we did run into a lot of challenges was Lupron for prostate cancer um, for some of those of those donut holes that exist with the Medicare, uh, certain Medicare patient populations. And uh, for those patients, we are initially able to leverage some COVID flexibilities and waivers uh, to be able to treat them uh, in the home during the height of COVID. But eventually, um, many of those, those patients with prostate cancer uh, ran into very high out-of-pocket copays, and some of them did then switch back um, to the infusion suite. So that's sort of our, you know, ongoing challenge there. I would say that today, yeah, you know, breast cancer Lupron at home has really become the new standard of care at Penn. Uh, but unfortunately, because of some of those challenges and with many of our prostate cancer patients having Medicare, many of them have now flipped uh, back to the suite. Great. Great. Thank you so much. So a couple of questions came up for you, uh, Ryan Nip. Uh, one is about change management. How did you get the institution to essentially take up this modality of care as quickly as you did? And then another question arose about uh, what you were actually doing in the home in that initial pilot phase, in addition to having re uh, patients record of uh, their symptoms and everything that you showed in your presentation, what, what actual care were you providing to them at home in, uh, beyond administration, presumably, of the, uh, of the prostate cancer drug? Yeah, good questions. I think the first one about the uptake and the buy-in from our clinicians is partly kind of what Karen was talking about at the end, where we, we were highly focused in the GI oncology group with that first pilot, which is all of my peers, first of all. And then the head of our cancer center is a GI oncologist and the stand up to cancer trial that was being run was his trial. And, and as I, maybe people don't know, but leadership at Mass General is phenomenal with regards to supporting these types of studies. And so when the leadership from the very top supports the study from day one and continues to support it throughout, that says volumes about you know getting buy-in from all the other clinicians in our group. And then two, we had a ton of communication kind of also speaking to what uh, the group at uh, Mount Sinai was talking about with this like excessive feedback. We were presenting to our group like every other month just to make sure how was the email communication, how was they, how were they feeling about the care being provided by Medically Home, were there any gaps, were there too many emails, were there too many phone calls, how could we adapt it? So we were really getting feedback at every juncture we could from patients, caregivers, and clinicians to make sure that the buy-in was good. And the second piece about what we were doing at the home, which I also saw a question about the algorithms that we developed, those were developed largely by me and some of the other GI oncologists in our group. But also we ran those by our nurse practitioners and our nurses in our clinic who are phenomenal, made sure that everybody had buy-in on those algorithms. And that's where we had very specific details for if somebody triggered for nausea, this is what we would have done in clinic. We'd like for you to do this at home. If somebody had pain, this is what we would have done in clinic. This is what we'd like you to do at home. So that's what we were doing at the home was managing symptoms, largely managing hypotension, dehydration, fatigue, and nausea was a common issue managing, managing at home as well, which went quite well. But what we, what we ran into a lot was uh, tachycardia, hypotension, dehydration, lightheadedness. Those are things that we can easily deploy services at home to give IV hydration and make sure patients are feeling better quickly. So that's just a brief overview. There was a lot of other things, but that's probably one of the most common. Great, great. Thank you so much. So we'll take one final question, and then let me suggest that when we do produce the comparison grid that I referenced earlier, that will answer some of the questions others of you have posted, and then we'll try to get any specific ones uh, to be answered as well in a, in a document. Um, so the final question is, how important is it to have an existing hospital at home program in place before you start a cancer hospital at home program? And I think with only one exception, most of you started your cancer hospital at home programs independent of the institution having any hospital at home program. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we had no other hospital at home going. It was just, we just did it purely for cancer patients. Um, the, you know, the university hadn't any other hospital at home programs going. And of course, Yale is gonna build off of its uh, uh, incipient uh, hospital at home program, Karen, but we, cancer hospital at home is not in place yet at Yale. Um, 
Lindsay, was there a, another hospital home program in place at Penn? Uh, no, hospital at home uh, was really our, uh, we, I will say, generally speaking, we provide cancer care um, to patients at home through our home infusion entity um, in both a planned fashion for certain drugs, as well as a supportive care um, context. But our cancer care at home program was really sort of our initial signature push to try and uh, more systematically move planned anti-cancer therapy treatments to the home. And at Mount Sinai, of course, there was an extant hospital at home program before the cancer hospital at home program. So that was the one exception to the general rule I invoked. And Al Su, unfortunately, has had to drop off. So we can't ask him uh, what, what benefit there was in starting with hospital at home first. I want to thank all of our presenters for this really important discussion today. As we said, uh, it clearly we, they've demonstrated proof of concept that cancer patients can successfully be hospitalized at home, even if every shred of the evidence is not yet in on many of these programs, there's a very, very promising start and a lot of reason to believe that these programs can be expanded, replicated elsewhere, and developed further. So thanks again to all of our speakers. Thanks so much to those of you in the audience. We'll get as many questions answered as we can and hope to see you at a future uh, installment of a next year's version of Cancer Hospital at Home and many more programs we, we are sure will be able to be profiled. John, over to you. I just wanted to thank you, Susan, and all the speakers for their really fine presentations. And of course, all the audience who joined us for this really rich discussion uh, during the last hour. R wanted to remind folks about our webinar series that are that is available at hahusersgroup.org. Uh, next slide as well as the various other resources on that, um, on that page, uh, including uh, our Technical Assist Assistance Center and the fine resources that are there. And finally, uh, last slide, uh, I wanna thank our sponsors uh, for today's uh, webinar, uh, the American Academy of Home Care Medicine, the American Hospital Association, uh, and the Duke Margulis Center for Health Policy, and of course, the John A. Hartford Foundation for its ongoing support of the Hospital at Home Users Group. Thank you all and we will see you next time.